morning, everyone. Good morning. I think I'm going to need to use this. I got no power on it. On this? On the mic? All right, I'll just use this microphone here. Uh, it's good to be with you guys here today. I am filling in for the person who is filling in for me. So, <laughs> so here we are, right? But it's good because it means we can do the next uh, part of Romans chapter 9. So let's go ahead, if you will, turn with me there to Romans 9, verses 19 to 21 we'll look at today. All right, now as we're going through this, we've got to remember that what Paul is going to be talking about today, it's not in a vacuum. Right? He's continuing on this argument that he's been building from the two previous Sundays. All right? And if we remember last week, what he had talked about there, uh, Paul had said that God has mercy on whom he has mercy, and he hardens whom he hardens. And we talked about the example of Pharaoh and how all of that worked out, and, and we challenged the question, if God is hardening whom he hardens, is there injustice involved with that? And Paul said, no exclamation point absolutely not and then we kind of triangulated that passage with some other passages of scripture and i think we came down with a very reasonable explanation biblically as to why there is no injustice involved with that at all so today paul's going to continue on um, he's going to address uh, some other parts of this but it's still part of the same argument that we've been talking about for a little while so let's go ahead and we'll jump in here and we'll read verses 19 to 21. One of you will say to me, then why does God still blame us? For who is able to resist his will? But who are you, a human being, to talk back to God? Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, why did you make me like this? Does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery for special purposes and some for common use. All right, so Paul gives us the next installment of what he's building here. And he starts off in verse 19 with this question, right? And so in light of last week, God hardens whom he hardens, see Pharaoh, for example. In light of that, the question is, if God has hardened Pharaoh's hearts, then why does Pharaoh get punished? Why is there a problem? He said in verse 19, why does God still blame us for who is able to resist his will? That's the question. It's the continuation of the, the question uh, from last week. And so he asks the question, if God's doing the hardening, then what choice do we have but to go along with that? And of course, if you remember last week when we dug into the complete story of what happened with Pharaoh, we saw he really did have a choice. God had just continued what Pharaoh had started. And so when we read this part, right, asking that question, well, if God's going to work in me, what choice do I have? And then we've got him giving this word picture of the clay and the potter and who is the clay to ask the potter uh, who created him, like, and, and to force any image he has on, onto the potter, right? We've got that, and so it can kind of feel like he's connecting up this clay and potter uh, example to the question of injustice. And so it almost reads like Paul is saying, yeah, listen, God hardens whom he wants to harden, and that's just his prerogative, right? Who are we to question that? And that's not exactly, though, where Paul is going here. We've got the perspective issue happening here, like we talked about last week. We're only seeing a part of an argument. But also, we have to recognize here, Paul is moving on in what he is talking about. And we get the clue or the indication that Paul is changing what he's addressing here in verse 20. But who are you, a human being, to talk back to God? And that's the key to our whole passage today. Paul is saying he, the whole, whole example of the, the potter and the clay, that has nothing to do anymore with the explanation that God is not unjust in what he's doing. That was what he finished already. That's what we talked about last week. Verse 20, he is now saying, in light of last week's explanation, some people still shake their fist at God and say, what choice do we have, God? Is this not injustice? And Paul says in verse 20, do not talk back to God. 
It's not okay to do. That's not something we should be doing. And so the, the example then that he gives about the potter and the clay, that's uh, addressing the point about not talking back to God and why we should not do that and how that's out of line, not providing an explanation of why God has hardened whom he has hardened. And so what we wind up with or what we see Paul's point in these verses is it's a rebuke to those who would shake their fist at God and demand answers from him and question God, why have you done what you have done? And specifically, when we're looking at the context, remember Paul's addressing this larger question right now about Jews and Gentiles in the church. Remember we had the other question he'd previously answered, if God had um, uh, carved out for himself a chosen people and they rejected Christ, is God unjust in rejecting them? You know, is that okay? And how is it that the Jews uh, missed, uh, missed this in the first place? So we've got um, the picture then really, I think what he's referring to here would be the Jewish people who missed Christ being the Savior, shaking their fists at God and saying, you know, you hardened us or uh, we were, uh, you know, they, they're believing their salvation comes from their birthright. They're holding on to that. And they say, we've got the birthright. Why does God still blame us? Who's able to resist this thing? So we've got that larger discussion happening and so we can understand what Paul is talking about there, but he also presents us with this additional point of application here that I think is really important for us and worth talking about. We talk, think about this picture of the potter and the clay, and uh, the potter has the right to do whatever he wants to out of the clay, and uh, what, what purpose or what place does the clay have to ask the potter or demand answers like, why did you make me like this? Why did you make this other person like this? And the application here really comes down to a uh, situation or a concept about what is our worldview. Worldview is just a, a philosophy of life. It's a conception of the world. Your worldview is the lens through which you view everything that happens around you. And so where I think we can get something out of this from our day here is that the Israelites uh, had the wrong worldview. They were trying to look at everything that was going on and they had this worldview of we're saved through the law, we're saved through our birthright, and they're trying to apply that to this system that God has put into place and it didn't work. And we today in 21st century America, we don't have that same problem of misapplying the birthright, I mean, at least I don't think anybody in this room does, but we do still uh, have this problem with conflicting worldviews of our society and a biblical worldview. And uh, this is, I think, worth, worth digging into. So let's go there then. According to our society, according to our culture, the worldview that we have now isn't a biblical worldview in our society. It's what's called secular humanism. You're probably familiar with this term, but this is the worldview that we have all um, agreed to, I guess, in our culture to abide by, to accommodate this um, diversity of different beliefs and different people. And here's a quick definition of secular humanism. It says uh, secular humanism is an outlook or a system of thoughts attaching prime importance to human rather than divine supernatural matters. Humanist beliefs stress the potential value and goodness of human beings, emphasize common needs, and seek solely rational ways of solving human problems. All right, this up here is our society's view. This is what's taught in schools. I was taught this however long ago I was in public school. Um, that's not changed since then. This is what's held up as virtuous today. And if you don't dig into it too much, it sounds kind of good, right? It's pretty nice. We're looking for answers. We're uh, kind of including everybody. We're focusing on solving problems and it's rational and it all sounds well and good. But if we dig into it, we see that biblically, there are a number of problems with this worldview. And we'll just work through them here at a very high level. The first sentence, an outlook or system of thoughts attaching prime importance to human rather than divine or supernatural powers. All right, secular humanism is 
Ignoring God, focusing on man. And the Bible says that's a problem when we do that. Psalm 118, verses 8 through 9. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in humans. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. Jeremiah 17, 5. This is what the Lord says. Cursed is the one who trusts in man, who draws strength from mere flesh, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. So we see already, right here in the first sentence, our culture, our society is taking us down a road that is contrary to the word of God and how we should be living our lives. Next part. Humanist beliefs stress the potential value and goodness of human beings. This one feels real good, right? I think this is why people like this worldview. But again, the Bible says life isn't like that. Romans chapter 8, verse 10. There is no one righteous, not even one. That's why we need Jesus, right? Psalm 53, 1. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt and all their ways are vile. There is no one who does good. Next part, secular humanism emphasizes common human needs. This is also contrary to what the Bible says we should, uh, the way we should be living our life. Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 to 34. Jesus said, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life. What you will eat or drink or about your body, what you will wear, is not life more than food and the body more than clothes. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If this is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans chase or run after all of these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all of these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Completely contradictory, uh, the uh, secular humanism is to what the Bible guides us. And the last part Secular humanism seeks solely rational ways of solving human problems. And this is wording. It's kind of like a stick in the eye to, to God himself because this is saying that human problems, there is a worldly solution to them and that is rational. And that presupposes that any other solution, one involving God, must therefore be irrational. It's baked into the language here. Right? Secular humanism seeks solely rational ways of solving human problems. But again, the Bible says that this is incorrect. Proverbs 14, 12, there is a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 to 6, trust in the Lord with all your hearts and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your paths straight. This, my friends, is the predominant view of our culture. All right? This is what's taught in schools. This is what's broadcasted on TV. This is what's held up as being virtuous. We got rid of God some time ago and replaced him with this. And I believe it is absolutely insidious because it seems harmless, right? On the surface, you just read this and it sounds kind of nice. And people will say, well, listen, we've got more than just Christians here in this country. We need some other worldview to put into place so we can all get along and work together and be productive. And it almost seems reasonable until we dig into it and we realize every single word of our definition is specifically designed to contradict a biblical worldview. I believe this is put into place specifically for the reason to turn people away from God. If we remember James chapter 3, which we come back to time and time again, James talks about 
two types of wisdom being available to us when we make decisions and we reflect on what's around us. He says there is godly wisdom that comes from the Lord. We can find that from reading our Bibles and, and talking to God, and that will produce spiritual fruit. It will produce uh, the fruit of the Spirit. Good things will come from that. But James had said there's also the concept of worldly wisdom, the other type that we can apply and he says right in there when he's explaining worldly wisdom, he says that's the stuff that comes from the innermost part of man where feelings and emotions come from. And he also says that type of wisdom is demonic. Right? That is exactly what this is right here. This is all based on feelings. This is all what comes from the innermost part of man. And James had said where that type of wisdom truly comes from. So let's plot this out. We'll work through how this, uh, how this plays out in real life here. And uh, then hopefully we'll get a good, a good appreciation of this. And then we'll tie all this back to Romans chapter 9, I promise. Okay, so this is you or me or, or anybody else, but this is a person. And so our, our culture says that, you know, we've got this whole idea of secular humanism. And we need to interpret ourselves and what is around us based on how we feel about it. I mean, that's what, that's what the world is all about. It's all about feelings. And so one of the big things, and maybe more for men than women, but it's still something for all of us, they say we all have a job, and that is part of our identity, right? Our job is part of who we are. That's going to shape how we look at things and drive how we make some of our decisions because we are our job, according to uh, the, the thought of the day. Also, this is a big one now, we've got this concept now of race. And so what our culture says, or secular humanism says, is look, everybody's, every, the lens through which everybody uh, looks through and observes the world and experiences the world, you cannot help but have an experience uh, that is connected to the particular race that you are and, and interacting with other races. And so they say every single thing must be filtered through here because if you look a certain way, your experience in our country is different than if you look another way. And you can't possibly understand or, or, or connect with or have a similar experience to someone else who looks a little bit differently from you. And so they say, we need to make sure we think a lot about this and, and apply those aspects of, of, of who we are biologically, I guess, to uh, our worldview and how we process things. Gender, here's another big one. All right, it used to be that our culture had said, well, we have to also think of ourselves and filter how we view everything based on whether we are the gender that is the oppressor or the oppressed. And depending on which category you fall into, uh, then this is going to be, you're going to have a different experience in life. Now, recently, our culture has changed and says there are actually 72 genders, and we need to spend time figuring out which one we are, and that kind of colors our experiences with everything else, right? This is uh, a, a moving target, and, and this is something we all have to work through. We've got a uh, contribution to society. Everybody feels the need to leave their mark on society, or we're told, you know, we have to, in order to have a meaningful life, we have to fundamentally change a particular institution uh, to improve some particular uh, situation or whatever. We all have to have this contribution uh, to society. Right and wrong. Here's another good one. This is one that we have to, we're told we have to work through because what's right for me may be wrong for you and uh, vice versa. So we need to spend time working through, well, what really is right and wrong? And how does that fit with these other bubbles here? And there's plenty more bubbles that we could put up, uh, but there's a last one here that we could include, and that's God. And I put God here with a lowercase g because this is our worldview, right? This is our culture's worldview, secular humanism. And just because it's secular doesn't mean there's no place for a God. But our culture will say, yes, yeah, spirituality is a good thing, but everybody needs to kind of go out into the world and look around and think about what all the other bubbles they have and then find a God or, or a religion that kind of works with that or that we see ourselves in or, or that speaks to us. And maybe take a little bit from this religion and a little bit from that religion and then that works for you. But God with a lowercase g is certainly one of the one of the bubbles that would be part of making up who we are and how we view the entire world. And again, we could spend all day putting different bubbles up here. I just came up with a few quick ones. 
um, to, to work through to give as an example. And so our society says you as an individual need to work through all of these things. And as you think about things and as you experience things, what you have in your bubble will color how you will evaluate that. That'll determine what your experience is and what you want to do with that. But the problem is when we're working through every single one of these things, every person then is left with the need to harmonize what all of these things are so they all work together. Otherwise, the world doesn't make sense. So people spend an enormous amount of time thinking about this and processing this and changing what they believe to, to update this or to update that. And then constantly this has to be revisited because we know that over time society says what should fit in these bubbles changes. And for most of the people in the room in our lifetimes, we have seen a great deal of change in this bubble down here about what's right and what's wrong. Right? When most of us were kids, we knew what was right and what was wrong. And now today, it's different. Society has changed some of the rules. And so what we are expected to do then in our worldview is to update what's in our right and wrong bubble. That's going to color the rest of our experiences. But now suddenly when we have done that, and we'll just pick an example. Uh, we talked before about this uh, question of gender. When I was a kid, when most of us were kids, there were only two but now what's right and wrong has updated that and we're told there's 72 genders. So once our what's right and wrong bubble has changed, now that conflicts with another one of our bubbles. So we have to go back up there and we have to start changing that and on and on it goes. Uh, and it's uh, you know, no wonder why uh, the world is as confused as it is. But the big problem is once we do that and once we start updating all of these things, we can find that whatever is in our little bubble that we have off to the side where we reserve our feelings and our relationship to God, suddenly that one doesn't work anymore based on how everything else has been updated. Right? If we're trying to keep up with what's going on in society but we're still going to church, we can very easily find ourselves in the situation that Paul warned us about in Romans chapter 9, verse 19, shaking our fist at God and saying, these things don't fit together anymore, God. Why does God still blame us for who is able to resist his will? Why, God, would you condemn someone for doing what is now right based on your antiquated system of what was once wrong? Romans chapter 9, verses 19 uh, through 21, Paul rebukes this line of thought. Who are you, a human being, to talk back to God? Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, Why did you make me like this? Does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery for special purposes and some for common use? God addressed the same kind of questioning in the book of Job. Job chapter 38, verses 2 to 7, God said to Job, Who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? Or what were its, on what were its footing set? Or who laid its cornerstone while the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy? God continues with these questions, question after question, for several more chapters. Remember, in our passage today, Paul is not addressing why it's okay for God to do the things that he does. Right? That was last week. Today, he's rebuking ridiculousness like this. Right? He's rebuking people who change all the other bubbles in their lives and then shake their fist at God and say, why, God, do you not make sense? God, you must change. Surely you must be this way. Paul is rebuking that line of thought. People make life so complicated. And in reality, life isn't that complicated. It's not easy, but it can be pretty simple. The answers are all in the Bible, and they're all absolutely clear only becomes complicated when we start running from God and applying other worldviews that are specifically meant to contradict the Bible, confuse the issue, and make this one bubble with God into a lowercase g and make it smaller and smaller and smaller. 
can go through these. We can look at them one by one, and we'll call it a day. So this question about our job you know, impacting our worldview or our identity, who are we? The Bible says you are not your job. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, you are an image bearer of God. And this question of race, one of the biggest ones that we are dealing with today, this idea that we experience our life differently because of our race, or we have to bring race into every single thing, is absolutely ridiculous. This concept of race came out of Darwinism in the 1800s. This is a relatively new idea. And what race is saying is all it is is if uh, it's a presupposition that evolution is true, and so if we all came from one organism that just happens to become alive and then over time it's split into more and more organisms and there's a survival of the fittest what darwinism said was well people if we evolved from other animals people must be continuing to evolve and when they looked around the world and saw that in different places some people had some different features different pigmentations or whatever and they said ah this is evidence of evolution working right now these different races are the different uh, branches of, of humans that are forking out and changing and evolving. Now, since then, the science of genetics has proven this is absolutely untrue. It's false. Just not true. Yeah, people look a little bit different. Yes, that's in genetics, but we are all people. We are all fundamentally the same from a genetic perspective. But for some reason, race is still a thing, right? This is still something we talk about and we obsess about. And now, Today, with our politically correct world that we live in, we have to acknowledge evolution and that everything's changing. And so we've got this idea of the different branches of people changing, right? These are different races. But if we try to say uh, that there's any difference between any of these diverging branches of evolution, that's somehow hateful, right? It doesn't make any sense at all. And so it's no wonder that the world is confused and very, very angry. In the science of genetics, has only recently discovered what the Bible told us 2,000 years ago. That's Acts chapter 17, verse 26. And God made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth. Now, caveat, that's from the King James, probably not the greatest translation of this passage, but I think it's instructive. God made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth. Gender. All right, so we got our issue there. Our identity is supposed to be shaped by our gender. However many there are, we are either the oppressed gender or the oppressor, or now there's 72 of them, I guess. But the Bible says, no, that's not correct. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. The Bible specifically calls out two genders, and it says both male and female, are image bearers of God. We are equal in essence. And so we may live in a society that has not treated both of the sexes equally uh, over the years. Um, that doesn't mean that biblically, when it calls out a difference, that there is inequality there. Both male and female were created in the image of God. And yes, there is a division of labor in the marriage model that's in the, that's in the Bible, uh, but there's also a division of labor amongst the three persons of the Trinity. Right, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are all of equal essence. They are, no one is greater than any other, yet they have different roles to play. Marriage is a picture of that in a way. And uh, we are created in the image of God, so there is a division of labor as well. Our contribution, oh, and the idea of being more than two genders. Listen, I think all of this is just about rejecting Genesis 127 that lays out these two genders in the image of God. And so saying there's anything else, it's a rejection of Genesis 127, how we were created. This whole idea of having to uh, leave our mark on society or that we only have value if we're crusading for a particular thing in our culture, Ephesians chapter 4 verses 22 to 24 explains, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. So our contribution to society, our job is not to change society. Our job is not to crusade for justice. Our job is to be conformed more and more to the likeness of Jesus. Right and wrong look at that one next. And we've been over this one already, but 
Uh, right and wrong is not something that we need to fret over what's right for you, what's wrong for me, or what do we need to update. The Bible tells us what's right and what's wrong. Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 to 26, the acts of the sinful nature are obvious, and then it lists them. Paul tells us what they are, and then he goes on to say what the fruit of the Spirit is. And so we have good, we have evil, we have right, and we have wrong. And it's very clear when we read the scripture, read this passage, that list of what's right and what's wrong is not different for one person than it is for another. It's not dependent on what our culture says is what's right and what's wrong. And the list doesn't change. It's right here in our Bibles. And of course, then we're left with the most important one, our last bubble, and that's who is God? Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, God said to Moses, I am who I am. John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And we see again here, the Bible is absolutely clear. We don't create God. We're not to go out and shop for the God that we like the best or that we want to have in our lives. He is who he is. Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, why did you make me this way? Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? The only worldview that we need is a biblical worldview. God tells us everything we need to know about who we are, everything we need to know about who he is, and everything that we need to know about how to go about our day-to-day -day lives. And these principles do not change. They are perfect. They are simple, maybe not easy, but they are absolutely clear. We'll go ahead and we'll call it a day. Lord willing, next week we can meet back together again and we'll continue on. He's going to reach back to some more Old Testament prophecy and uh, use that and wrap that into his argument here in a new and interesting way. And uh, then we'll continue on uh, with where he's going with this. Would you close with me in prayer? Dear Lord, we thank you so much for letting us be here today and Thank you for letting us worship you together. And again, we think of our brothers and sisters who are ill today and not able to be with us and ask that you would please heal them, please comfort them, please help them to all be okay. Uh, we ask that you please get us home safely and please bring us back together next week that we might be able to worship you together again as a family. We love you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.